I'm responsible for a team at Essex County Council that have been working on this agenda for about uh, a couple of years now. Um, uh, at one level, we're responsible for energy efficiency and reducing uh, Essex County Council's emissions. So we're responsible for the utilities budget at the council, uh, which has about 300 buildings in its core estate and over a couple of hundred schools on our utilities contract. Um, as an authority, we have still have quite a significant land holding and um, in a reasonable size fleet. So we do a lot of work looking inside the organisation, thinking about how we can reduce our emissions across that estate. And we've got very active programme of work looking at energy efficiency across the estate, on-site renewable generation and looking at heating solutions. Um, but there's a challenge in that for us. Um, we're the second largest county authority in the country. There is an issue for us about scale. And that's something I'll come back to mention at the end. Um, but we're doing an increasing amount of work, um, which is ex more, much more external facing, working with the community. So we have run a very successful collective solar panel purchasing scheme last year for residents in Essex. Um, we run eco and warm homes fund projects. Um, but we've also got a number of innovative European funded projects where we are looking at how we can work with the community to install renewable generation on our on our assets um, so in the case of these projects it's a couple of primary schools and one of our outdoor centers but then thinking about how we can keep more of the value of that energy in the local community using uh, mechanisms like local energy tariffs so we we are however relatively new on the community energy scene um, I suppose it's fair to say. So in, and in recognition of that, um, I think we saw that there's a huge amount of untapped potential. Um, and so we engaged Community Energy South back in the autumn of last year to do some work to really help us understand um, what community energy looked like in Essex. Um, because it wasn't very visible to us. And equally, as a large organisation, we probably were not very visible to individuals and groups in Essex who wanted to work in this space. So um, Community Energy South helped us to develop a roadmap where um, they did a lot of work to identify individuals and organisations in the county who might be interested in uh, community energy. Um, and it helped us to um, uh, identify those organisations, but also just um, engage with them and understand where the skills and the experience gaps might be. So um, Community Energy South ran a, a survey on our behalf uh, with the purpose of really um, starting, to, starting a conversation with those groups about how we could best support them, um, what their uh, requirements were, um, and how we can try and help them scale and develop community energy schemes in the, in the county. Um, some of the take home messages from that survey were, um, well, the first thing was we had a very fantastic response. We were delighted that we got nearly 60 um, responses to the survey. And actually that just confirmed my suspicion that there would be a huge amount of interest. But, but with that, there was also a lot of work already happening actually. So over a third of those groups had already engaged in some renewable energy project. And so that just reinforced to me that as an organisation, we were not doing as good a job as we needed to do to understand what was happening in the community and be connected. And actually, we were probably missing an opportunity to help those groups and those individuals in the county connect uh, amongst themselves as well and, and share learning. Um, listening to the responses we got, there was clearly uh, an appetite and a desire for uh, more information. Um, to get an understanding of what could be a pathway for these groups um, for them to develop community energy schemes. Um, there was a, a strong response that there was a need for project funding and um, training and development, but also networking as well. So um, it was a really, really, uh, you know, it's been a fantastic project and we're really delighted with the work that Oli and his team have done. Um, but I think it's just a starting point. So off the back of that, having had that very positive response, it's given us um, the evidence and the insight to 
um, engage other politicians in the county and senior officers and, and make a case for um, the next stage of work. And so I'm, I'm really pleased to say that we've been able to secure funding um, through European grant funding, but also from within the council now to, to create a CECOM fund, um, which will help us um, take some of the groups that came out of that survey process, help them start to put some of the building blocks in place, um, start to um, constitute themselves where, where they are already well organized, help them start to put business plans, identify projects as well. And, and also make connections with the council. Um, I mean, it is true that, you know, as an authority, we, we are investing in renewable energy ourselves, but I think there is a limit to how much we can do and how fast we can do it. Um, and particularly in light of the COVID um, and, uh, and the pressures that that's put on council funding. And um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, just to say a little bit briefly about where we are with um, climate emergency. Um, as an authority, we haven't declared a climate emergency, but we have set up a Climate Action Commission, which has an independent chair, um, Lord Randall, who was uh, Environment Advisor to the Theresa May government, was chairing that, that group. Um, and I think what, um, what will happen with that commission is we're going to be putting in a lot of um, evidence to the commission about um, the steps we need to take as an authority to reduce emissions, but also the county of Essex. Um, but the authority, I think, is going to shine a, a, a hold up a mirror to our politicians as well um, and, and put forward some very difficult decisions and, and recommendations to them about the scale of investment that's required to, to get the county to near zero. Um, and the, the, uh, the commission has um, five special interest groups and, and one of those is community engagement. I think what that recognises is that, um, that there's certainly a very strong political will to engage with the residents of communities in Essex in, in a bottom-up approach um, and really trying to scale up some of the work that we've just started to identify through the roadmap work that we've done with Community Energy South but also engage with any number of other groups that are already very active on other related issues, um, such as um, plastics agenda or um, uh, tackling waste as well. So there's a very strong appetite um, uh, within the authority for a very active um, approach to community engagement. I think what happened with um, COVID has been quite striking in terms of um, the challenges it's posed for the authority. Um, and I think that pre-COVID, there had been a very strong narrative in the authority about economic growth, but it was very focused on particular sectors. It was very focused on um, particular, attracting particular skills and jobs and businesses into the county. And that's changed, actually. And the conversation that we're having now with inside the authority is... Um, is actually really about um, creating jobs and creating jobs as, 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 uh, as many jobs as, and as a diverse number of jobs as we possibly can um, within the county and recognizing that probably about a third we estimate somewhere around about a third of the workforce in Essex is currently furloughed so it's very difficult to know um, quite yet how many of that those will translate into unemployment figures but um, I think what that means for us is that when we're working on community energy and we're thinking about the opportunity that's presented by investment in, in a green recovery, we need to have a strong narrative around jobs. Um, and that needs to resonate, uh, uh, that will resonate very strongly with, um, with uh, politicians. Um, there's also uh, um, uh, uh, a very strong um, appetite as well in the authority to um, work through community engagement, as I've said. And one of the things that's been a huge success during the COVID, um, uh, we can put, turn it that, um, during the COVID period, has been working with the community through social media and through social campaigns. Um, and actually, I think that we will need to think carefully about how we engage with communities and through what forums. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up there, um, but I think that, as I said, that the role, in terms of the role that community energy groups can play in the recovery, I think there is a huge opportunity for us around um, the climate action agenda. 
I do think as an authority, the pressure that we've seen on, uh, on the authority's finances means that we will need to think very differently about how we fund and support initiatives. And so opportunities for us to think about community funding and um, community bonds and, and similar funding mechanisms will start to open up in a way that I haven't done before uh, in the authority. And I think that there's certainly an appetite to see, see things done at scale and at pace as well. So again, um, a, a key question for us will be when working with community energy groups will be how can we support groups to move at pace, but also how can we support the initiatives to, to scale as well. So, um, and I'll just come back to my opening point about um, the size of the authority, quite simply, you know, the, the, the size of our estate and the size of our, um, uh, the, the number of buildings that we, that we manage across the core estate and with schools as well, means that there is ample opportunity in terms of assets that we can bring to the table for community groups to, to invest in. I think the challenge for us is, and the question I've got in my mind, is how can we take um, you know, a handful of very promising projects and turn that into um, dozens of projects at scale quite quickly? So I'll, I'll stop there and take any immediate questions. Thank you for your time. That's great. I'm going to ask people is, um, if we can move on to the next speaker and then have questions for change. Can I just interrupt, Ollie? You you sound. I can't hear you properly. Is everybody else having the same problem? Yes, your sound's gone a bit odd, Ollie. Oh, has it? Oh, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, I was just saying, Tom. One thing that really struck me with the Essex is the fact that you set up your climate change commission, and uh, you know, and then the coronavirus hit. So, yeah, but it was well established, which means that building back better afterwards, it's, it's one of your top themes of your council and really a driver of the council. And, um, and, and it's great. We're really enjoying working with you with new groups and, and um, hopefully it's a good example for, for other counties and how local authorities can work with community energy. So if we then move on to the next speaker, which is Nicola from um, Made Energy. Uh, hopefully there's not too much feedback. I can hear myself feeling back, but Nicola, um, Made Energy is one of our, uh, I already introduced you earlier, but um, one of our top groups and um, up in Maidenhead near Windsor, and I'm always amazed to know that Windsor is also has real vulnerability as well with, with um, around Windsor, um, as, it, as in fuel poverty. And um, you've got some great projects. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks for the invitation to be here this morning in my own house. <laughs> So um, I'm Nicola Davidson, one of uh, nine directors of Made Energy, which is a very small community benefit society run entirely by volunteers. We span two local neighbouring authority areas because that's where our directors live. So we're at the Royal Borough of Windsor Maidenhead and Runnymede Borough Council. So two small areas compared to uh, a giant county council like Essex. We have a close affiliation with Windsor Maidenhead Two of our directors, including myself, are former council staff members. Uh, we left our roles there some years back to form a specialist fundraising enterprise, which to this day is still commissioned by the council to provide that service back. So they know us well personally, even if the two hats we wear can be confusing at times. So a little bit about the Made Energy journey. 
In 2014, we established a financial model for installing solar on community buildings. Then we secured £10,000 seed funding from the council, which paid for development of the governance and the legal framework required to set us up, and plus a little bit of um, initial investment. And I was so pleased to hear Tom a moment ago um, is arranging this support for organisations in this area, because without that, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have begun. It just wouldn't have been possible. In 2015, we established a plan following that initial investment and we, we raised full investment for one project in each of our local authority areas. They were successful and once installed, we did very little for the next few years, largely because it's, it proved difficult to get new projects going as, as a group of volunteers trying to do it in our spare time. In 2018, like everyone else, we learned that the solar feed-in tariff was coming to a close. Um, and We're all about solar, I should have said. So we notched it up a gear and identified more sites in the Windsor and Maidenhead area because that's the area we know best. Um, a launch event with the local press was pivotal in that the council invested a further £10,000 as Ollie mentioned earlier. From there we raised all the investment needed for a total of six solar sites and that investment was £450,000 and we now have over 100 members which is great. So far, our, pro our projects collectively save 71 tonnes of CO2 per year. It, three of our sites are owned by charities and three are schools with a local authority freehold. We recently secured further investment for a seventh project, which will be our largest. This is a leisure centre owned by Windsor Maidenhead Local Authority. And I'm going to talk about that as our little case study in just a moment. We feel that membership of key organisations is important to ensure our reach and remaining well informed. So we've got three membership areas. We're a member of the newly formed Climate Emergency Coalition in Windsor and Maidenhead, which collectively has pressured the council to commit to a um, 2050 net zero target and is currently trying to improve the council's environment and climate strategy. Made Energy aims to be a member which shows practical solutions. We're a member of our Chamber of Commerce, ensuring profile at main events, and that's to ensure that people, people know about us. And of course, we're a member of Community Energy South and Community Energy England, which is crucial to us, remaining aware of opportunities and, and all the all important networking. So this presentation really is about our relationship with local authorities. Um, so why have we gained such a successful relationship with our council? Um, because we have a long history primarily and we have personal relationships with officers and councillors which span nine years. Made Energy is non-political but we have a clear agenda of cu cutting carbon naturally. Crucially we don't pressure the council, we never vocalise opinion of it or require them to navigate us in any way. We simply aim to provide solutions to the green agenda that we all share. We can demonstrate year on year significant community buy-in, which is naturally quite compelling for a council. We remind them also of the interest payments they receive from their investments, which is material they can use in publicity if required. And in terms of our relationship with the other local authority, Runnymede Borough Council, well, that relationship barely exists because our one project in that area is an academy secondary school. So while the authority is the freeholder, we don't have a contract with them. It's the academy and, um, and the school itself. We're aiming to build a relationship with them, but it will probably mostly rely on the made energy directors that live in that area. And they haven't been quite as, as proactive as us because um, our projects naturally evolved in the Windsor Maidenhead area. But I think that will come. I've got a quick case study. I'm going to try and share my screen. If I can do that. Uh, here it is. You can do it, Nicola. Yes, it's working. It's yeah. working. <laughs> so this is Braywick Leisure Centre. This is an artist's impression of it, at least. So this is a huge new development to relocate our town centre leisure facility to a town edge playing field area. Despite our strong relationship with the council our tr and track record of securing community investment, 
council didn't bring us into this project. Instead, they left the renewables element to the site contractor due to simplicity and confidence that they had in their budget at that time. So that was natural. But budget has since tightened, as quite often happens. So last year, we were invited to take over the solar element of that development. Oops, there's another project. This is, this is, um, this is quite early on and it's, the project is actually nearly finished. So we raised the investment and we're now waiting to install a 107 kilowatt solar array, but only once the current contractor has left the site. At this late stage, if we were to commence our work while that main contractor was on site, they would apply charges, which would double the cost of our project. This install is by far not the maximum roof capacity available for us, but it's the maximum amount that complements the combined heat and power facility that the site has already committed to for the pool and the general heating. We hope there is potential to increase our capacity later possibly linked to further electric vehicle charging on site or even to export um, some excess energy to other neighbouring um, organisations in that vicinity. So in summary, our recommendations to others for building good relationships with the local authorities are as follows. Gather proof of concept of your group and activities. Get a solid understanding of the council's priorities. Most are struggling and restricting services to statutory obligations, but how they're implemented can vary enormously. Explain how your activity provides a solution to one or more of those priorities. In this way, they've got a better chance of justifying their engagement with you. Get input from officers and councillors, such as investment, advice, publicity, and even presence in meetings where possible. Ensure you're not gonna be hostage to any project deadlines. Remember, council decision-making can naturally be slow. So particularly if your council is involved, minimize failure and their potential embarrassment. Take your time to build trust with them. Find officers and councillors that actually get what you do and are willing to champion you you'll know that the same applies for development of any of your energy sites that you're working on. And use very simple and clear communications. Remember, they'll get bombarded by commercial providers, so ensure that they know how you are different and you represent um, the people in their constituency. And something we've, we've um, established recently is try and take a cookie cutter, co cookie cutter approach to the projects if you can repeating what you discover that you do really well. And I think that summarizes um, our relationship, which was what I intended this presentation to be about. So happy to take questions when it fits. Nicola, thank you so much. And I love those eight points and that cookie cutter approach. It's so important because your projects all last for 25 years and you're embedded in Maidenhead and, and Runnymede. And that's, that's a long time relationship that you're offering and solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank it's you. Interesting. It's interesting because we, we, we are now trying to promote a cookie cutter approach, but of course the feed in tariff for solar has changed. So we can only really develop projects um, that are solar based where the, the economy of scale allows for it. So that's what we're trying to do, but we also do want to take advantage of any, um, any tariffs and opportunities. So we are now looking at heat projects. So I'm, yeah. I'm keen to hear later on um, um, from, from Janet in Manchester about setting up heat projects because we do want to move one of our solar sites that we're doing at the moment. While we're, while we're providing solar, we also want to provide them with heat because they want to create a complete solution. So on one hand I'm saying cookie cutter, but the next hand I'm saying, take as much opportunity as you can. Brilliant. Well, that's right. Well, you can be agile and do that. So Nicola, great. Um, so we, without further ado, I'll say thank you very much. And we'll pick up on questions. Keep an eye on the chat because people might have direct questions for you. Um, thank you. So thank you very much, Nicola. We're going to hand over to John Taylor from the Energy Hub. John, I see your beard's grown. Yep, making the most of the lockdown. I had a head start, to be fair. It's not all new growth. But... Brilliant. Looks great. 
Um, are you set to go? Have you got a presentation? Yeah, let me just bring that up. Welcome, John. Yeah, that's coming up and we can see it. Over to you. Great, okay. Right, good morning everybody. Um, yes, I'm from an organisation called the Greater South East Energy Hub. Um, so we're a base funded team, um, part of their local energy programme, and we work out in the regions supporting LEPs and local authorities um, to accelerate the delivery of local energy projects in support of BASE's clean growth um, programmes and agenda. So um, yeah, we operate over quite a large geography. Um, there's a team of about seven of us, um, and I personally cover the southeast corner of the southeast hub. So I, yeah, Kent's east of West Sussex, Brighton, and parts of Surrey. Um, there are other energy hubs across the country as well, um, set up at the same time. So in every region of the England, there are similar teams working with the regional um, organisations like the LEPs, um, yeah, to try and embed a lot of this local energy um, thinking in the growth programs that are coming forward. Um, traditionally, that's been focused on like road building, housing, um, and then bigger energy infrastructure like offshore wind and nuclear. And we're there to give a lot more visibility and presence to the growing agenda around electrification of transport, smaller scale renewables, electrification of heat, and all that. So we're there to provide extra capacity to those bodies and um, local authorities to. Yeah, do better on those sorts of topics. Okay, so these uh, what I'll do is um, I'll just go over some of the kind of energy plans and strategies that have been developed over the last year because um, fortunately, yeah, I think in the post COVID build out, a lot of this net zero stuff is going to stick. Um, we've spent the last few weeks providing evidence back to Bayes and MHCLG and other government departments about what sort of work could be accelerated and scaled up if more um, investment was provided from the government around net zero and clean growth. So I think some of that kind of, kind of yeah, discussions around a kind of green recovery is going to come good, hopefully. So in each of these areas, um, a couple of years ago, Bayes commissioned regional energy strategies. And I think they're always good places to check about what the direction of travel for the various regions are. Um, so, let me just change the slide, take us a second. Yep, so across um, uh, the area covering from the South Coast, from Hampshire all the way around to Essex, this document was produced called the South to East Energy Strategy. And it was an example of what does this region need to contribute to meet the kind of longer term carbon budgets that the government has set up to 2032. Um, so this was prior to the net zero um, adoption, but it's all at the scale kind of necessary to kind of get us in that direction. And it shows um, yeah, various kind of working themes across low carbon heat, renewables, smart grids, transport, and energy saving and efficiency and particular project types similar to that cookie cutter approach that could be replicated in all areas. So we've been looking at things like solar car parks, district heating, helping councils review their own estates for energy efficiency and solar opportunities and things like that. And going a bit closer um, in geography, we've seen over the past year a lot of councils adopt climate emergency plans um, or yeah, take, yeah, um, more coherent approaches to this as Tom was referencing earlier. Um, so yeah, some have been published recently. Ada and Worthing down on the south coast have a really good action plan for a 2030 carbon neutral target for their own operations. Um, similar in Surrey, they've just published a new climate strategy and action plan. Um, we've done a bit of reviewing of these and some of the common challenges I think that are relevant for community energy groups to consider. That coming out of this um, there's a particular challenge about scaling up renewable heating um, yeah all these places particularly there's going to be slightly easier to do that off the gas grid I think um, just because of the economics of it but yeah all across the board renewable heating is an issue um, schools as well um, a, a common thing um, yeah, um, just the way schools operate, um, they're quite a challenge to still um, get in individually 
and encourage um, schools to make changes. So where communities have a presence with the schools and can influence them, that's always a useful thing. And the net part of these net zero plans are always a challenge as well. So when it comes around to offsetting, there's quite a bit of um, what these councils will need to still offset, either through they're looking at tree planting, but also procuring renewable energy from outside their own estate to help that. I'll go into that in a bit more detail. Right. Um, so again, how community groups can participate and promote existing council schemes is really um, relevant. This is yeah the bulk buy scheme Tom referenced earlier, Solar Together. It's also operating in other councils around the country. Um, so yeah, Kent have been running it, Suffolk, um, Essex, London, and we're trying to encourage other councils to adopt this endorsement of a bulk buy scheme, which um, yeah, it can lead to several thousand kind of installation jobs per auction round as people sign up to get kind of better value solar um, products. Um, yeah, could this sort of approach be expanded to other technologies? That would be interesting to see. So, and it also councils have been continuing to operate their fuel poverty support programs. So yeah, helping to promote and participate in those schemes will help kind of those jobs and installation um, works carry on. Um, slightly different tack, um, a lot of these um, projects around um, fuel poverty, it needs to expand to the rest of the markets. Um, we, yeah, we know there was some things around the Green Deal a few years ago, trying to make the able to pay energy retrofit market take off and it didn't quite happen. So these are a couple of really exciting schemes um, operating by some of the community energy partners like BESCO and Retrofit Works. So Warmer Sussex and Cozy Homes Oxfordshire are trying to trial a new whole house retrofit approach where you would get an integrated retrofit plan um, based around energy efficiency, renewable heating and renewables, um, which would then be financed through a kind of pay as you save kind of heat contract where you would, would, you would then stagger the repayments of that work over the lifetime of the installation, making it more affordable. Um, and I think, yeah, finding ways to support these sorts of pilots to scale up um, is going to be really valuable going forward. So participating in those and um, yeah, helping that. Okay. Um, and also um, pilot new approaches as well, um, kind of building back better. There's some examples about around the UK of places that have already innovated and are kind of living labs for what the next generation of the energy system is going to look like. So down on the Isles of Scilly, they've got a smart energy island project, which has been funded through Innovate UK. And it shows um, a kind of an island operating as a virtual power plant. So they're going to be in they've installed heat pumps, um, lots of solar panels across the island. They've got electric vehicles operating as kind of community pay-as-you-go vehicles, which then, when they're plugged in, operate as flexible batteries for the grids with two-way charging. Um, and then they're developing a software platform to um, balance out all these different supplies and demands to make a stable, localised energy grid, which can then interface with the wider national grid. And they're also um, putting all those assets on the island into some form of community-owned entity to ensure the financial benefits stay with the residents on the island as well. So they're partnering with the private sector and technology partners, but doing it through that social enterprise structure as well. And the format of this is now being applied in Oxfordshire and Sussex um, through like bringing that approach to the mainland through Innovate UK again. So there's Smart Hubs project in West Sussex, implementing a very similar approach and also Project Leo in Oxfordshire. So where funding opportunities come up, I would recommend community energy groups trying to get involved with these kind of more innovation focused projects as well and partner with local authorities on them. There's a few photos of the Isles of Scilly there, their solar rooftops and electric police cars all kind of making the most of the sunshine down there. Um, yep, sure, won't take much longer. Um, so, yeah, there's a partnering opportunity. So. Um, local authorities have land. Um, there's a power paired is a, a project run by Forum for the Future to help local authorities share assets and land with community energy groups. 
and also community energy groups are building out renewables and entering into power purchase agreements with local authorities can also help them offset their net zero commitments. And again, um, on the planning side, neighbourhood plans can are still the route to get these like installations like wind farms and solar farms um, integrated into the local planning system. And then there's money available through the community infrastructure levy in section 106 still for community energy projects. Um, on the pound side, yeah, we're seeing new financial instruments like community municipal bonds come forward. Um, this is a really exciting project where um, yeah, councils can borrow money from their citizens like um, to yeah, help green investment within the community, within the county. Um, and if this could open up new kind of new institutions for maybe revived building societies to fund some of that retrofit works. Um, sort of activity, so a really exciting innovation there. And then um, something that we're operating on, I'll just finish on, um, is the Rural Community Energy Fund. So we've still got over two million pounds of grant funding to pass out to community energy groups that want to look into technical feasibility studies for renewable energy projects in your locality. And we can do that for an initial feasibility grant of up to forty thousand pounds, and then a more in-depth and development grant of 100,000 to help you get through the planning process and do more detailed studies. Um, we've given out yeah, quite a few grants already to projects including district heating, water source heat pumps, solar farms, um, so that's all open for business through the lockdown and yeah, going to be around um, for the post-COVID recovery as well. So there's our details. Okay. Thank you, John. That's brilliant. Um, it's really good to hear those examples of the Silly Isles and Smart Hub and Project Leo and the link that the community energy and communities are involved with all those projects and, and form a part of it because, you know, to help communities actually embrace the change, they need to be involved. And um, I'm really glad you brought up community municipal bonds because um, it, um, I've heard a lot about these and and also read a lot about, you know, how war, Second World War, the war bond worked. Mm -hmm. And it feels like a really fitting time to explore this and a good link between local authorities and communities. So thanks, John. And your slides will be available. Keep an eye on the chat. No doubt there will be some questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you very much. And now we're heading up to Manchester, where um, Kate Eldridge um, can take over. Kate, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, I don't have any slides to share. I'm just going to tell you a story. Oh, wonderful. We're looking forward to that. So Kate from Greater Manchester Community Energy? Community Renewables. Community Renewables. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Kate Eldridge, I'm a founding director of Greater Manchester Community Renewables and I was formerly a director of Stockport Hydro as well. Um, those are both voluntary positions. In my day job, I'm company secretary for Unity Trust Bank. Um, so yeah, I'll talk about the GMCR experience of local authorities in the form of the story of GMCR. Um, a bit about GMCR to start, we install solar panels on schools and community buildings. The site gets a 25% discount on the electricity from the panels compared to their main supplier for the life of the project in exchange for a 21 year roof airspace lease. Um, we've got nine solar arrays, eight of which are on schools and seven of those are local authority schools. Now we weren't always good at working with local authorities. Um, our story begins in 2014 when Manchester City Council had crowdsourced ideas for spending the dividend they received from their investment in Manchester Airport Group. More than one person had suggested solar panels on schools and we formed a group to make it happen. The lead council member was keen and the officers were engaged and January sort of 2015 we'd done site feasibility, but the council wanted the project to be completed by April. And because of that, the project was moved to a different team of officers who decided to spend the money directly on installing a solar array. So a solar array was installed, 
by the council, um, but just it was the one array and it was not to do with GMCR. So after that, not to be dissuaded, we approached the nine other local authorities within the Greater Manchester area and Salford City Council were keen to work with us as they didn't have capacity to do any kind of this kind of project themselves. Um, at that time, we were receiving peer mentorship support from Bath and West Community Energy, who told us about the cooperation agreement that they had with their local council, which is a non-legally binding memorandum of understanding. Um, so we agreed something similar with Salford Council and on the back of that did some press work with the mayor and the planning and environment councillor celebrating our new partnership. Um, the climate change officer within the planning and environment team is very supportive. Um, he understands community energy and was already involved in an energy efficiency group as a volunteer. So, as you will know, in summer 2015, the government announced a proposed 90% reduction to the feeding tariff. So we had to pre-register our sites by the end of September 2015. So the climate change officer at the council quickly wrote out to all the local authority schools and asked them if they wanted to be involved. And that was really important because the council is a trusted partner of the school, whereas we were a group of volunteers with no track record who they probably never heard of. Um, so through that introduction, um, there were some schools who were, wanted to get involved and we then went on to meet with the head teacher or the business manager at the school and tell them more about the project. And from that, we had enough sites to do our first share offer. And just as an aside, since um, Nicola at Made Energy is here, thank you so much for writing a share offer before I had to write one because I read yours from cover to cover before I wrote mine. Um, so I'll go on to talk about the legal agreements, um, which is where the relationship became really important. The property team at the council then became involved, but they were very busy. Um, and the surveyor agreed to meet with us so we could tell him about, more about the project and encourage him to make time for it, given the deadline we were working to, to try and get things done during the school holidays. I won't pretend that everything went smoothly on schedule with legal agreements, but I also don't want to take up your whole day. So I'll just mention a few key points. Um, one of the things that the council helped with was before working on a lease, your solicitor will do some legal searches, um, one of which is the local authority search. And it costs a couple of hundred pounds per site that you pay to the council. And the council was kind enough to waive that fee for us. It's not much in the context of a council, but for a new voluntary group with no income stream and a limited budget, it was really appreciated. Um, we also engaged with the planning team at the council to confirm that our small solar arrays were permitted development. Um, and then the next thing that happened was that when we were talking about the lease, um, there's, there was a debate about what would happen if the 21 year lease was to end early. And there was discussions about how that would be resolved. And basically the the, comp the clause that we came up with in the end needed to be signed off by the mayor. It wasn't something that the property surveyor could sign off himself. And so that particular issue in the lease negotiations got escalated up to the mayor and it was signed off. And so that just shows the importance of him being involved at the cooperation agreement phase um, to approve that um, compensation clause. So in summer 2016, we went on to install panels on three schools in Salford. Yay! Um, we organised a launch event once the panels were installed and pupils from two of the schools attended and the mayor was kind enough to come along, along with local councillors from the um, areas where the schools were. And we did another celebratory kind of press piece. So in 2018, the fit had been reduced, but GMCR was back for more. Um, we asked the council's energy manager for a list of the high energy using schools because now the fit was lower and um, we wanted to have greater on-site usage um, of the electricity produced by the panels. And so the energy manager provided a list and we approached those schools. And I guess both GMCR and our contacts in the council were kind of learning as we went along and the property surveyor 
got the delegated authorities he needed to proceed with the leases at an early stage and that helped the timelines um, but we still haven't got it quite right because when we went to talk to the schools um, from the high, en high energy using list it turned out that some of them needed roof repairs the very next year and so wouldn't be suitable we also had an issue that the education team hadn't been fully engaged and so when a school that was talking to us had a question about the project they would go to their usual contact in the education team who didn't really endorse the scheme or didn't know much about it so in the end, that was resolved by um, internally in the council by the climate change officer another example of the council support is that um, we were talking to a school and the head teacher was on board and the um, chair of governors was on board but there was one particular governor who had questions about our electricity supply agreement with the school and the council was um, kind enough to arrange for one of their legal team to advise the school um, about our agreement and we renegotiated the whole agreement and convened a meeting with parties from the council their legal team the school governors um, but despite all that work and effort, um, this governor, governor wasn't persuaded and that um, site didn't go ahead. So that year we ended up doing two, um, two more sites. So 2019, we came back again for more, um, but we'd learned from our mistakes. So we had, at the very beginning, we had a meeting um, with, council, with the council where the energy manager, the property surveyor, the climate change officer, the planning officer and the education team were invited and we talked through the list of sites and we ruled out the PFI sites and the church sites and the ones needing repairs and we came up with a list to approach that way and since then we've been building, continuing to build on the relationship for example um, our share offers have been had a notice published in the council channels like um, their life in Salford magazine and the energy manager has been helping us to liaise with meter operators to sort out export meters and now one of our directors attends their low carbon board meetings as well um, if I've got time I'll go on to talk to a new about a new relationship that we're building with Berry Council which is another of the local authorities in Greater Manchester Okay, if I can give you a minute, can I give you a all minute? Right. Okay. Well, sorry. It's all right. So um, basically with that council, the governor from a school had heard about GMCR and approached us. And so that governor did a lot of the relationship building with the councillors on our behalf. And we talked directly to the property manager about the lease. But generally that um, governor did a lot of the relationship management for us. Um, so yeah in total we ended up with having nine sites which we've got now um it's they come to about 350 kilowatt peak um to conclude we worked with the officers that i've mentioned responsible for climate change planning energy and education the councillor with the planning and environment portfolio the councillors representing the area the school's based in the mayor the head teacher the business manager at the school and where we can the school governors and by doing so, we've received help in lots of different ways from identifying the sites, help with legals, the export meters, and the council's delivering on their carbon reduction priorities. They're getting an educational resource for schools and investment into their buildings, and occasionally some good publicity. We're showcasing renewable technology in the heart of the community. We're providing a display board um, at the site showing what's being generated. And this year we donated our first community fund payment of a thousand pounds to our first school for their recycling project and cameras for their bird boxes so it just shows that when community energy groups and local authorities work together it can genuinely be a win-win for both parties and the communities we serve thank you i'm happy to take questions okay thank you very much um like the other speakers we'll put the questions in the chat and then we'll pick up with yeah. them um, but thank you for highlighting that win, win, win and your timeline of all your projects and working with the councils, you know, and embedding yourselves in, in with the council and supporting them. Um, it's, it's brilliant to hear. And, and it, 
I see that Mike Smythe's on, on here today as well from Solar Schools and School Solar Co-op, sorry. And um, in, in the Southeast, we've, we've um, tried to map all the solar schools for 11 groups, which comes now to over 100 solar schools. And um, I'm really keen to try and encourage um, the sector as a whole, if we map all of our school projects, and try and get all the groups involved with schools um, to overlap and share experience. It would be so useful to everybody. And like, like you said, you know, up in Manchester, you were able to read Made Energy's share offer and, and you know, used it as a template. Yes, that was and very that's helpful. What community energy is all about. And these, thank you very much. Yeah, that was fun. It's a nice link. I look forward to, I'm sure you and Nicola will catch up offline. <laughs> um, so we're going up to, from Manchester, we're jumping across to, to Cambridgeshire huh? and um, where we've got Janet, who is up line. Have you got a presentation, Janet? Yes, I do. Hello. Ah, so hopefully you're going to share your screen. Hello and welcome. Thank and, you. Um, so. I'm going to press you for hopefully to, to be about eight minutes, if possible, so that we can really pick up on the questions okay. and hear from else. I will try to fly through. Can everyone see my screen okay? Janet. Yes, I can see your screen. You're away. Fantastic. Um, so, quick introduction to myself. I am Janet Hall, and I'm actually working as a community engagement consultant. Um, for a project that is led by Cambridge County Council. They have kindly lent me uh, the slides um, from today's presentation. Um, and the presentation is mainly focused around Heating Swap and Prior, which is a community heating project that I've been involved with for the last year. Um, I was hoping to actually show a video um, that gives an overview of the project, but it is two minutes long, so I can send you the link in the chat box instead um, to have a look at that. But just to give you a quick overview of the project, um, this is a community-led project. It was um, a community land trust that approached the County Council about bringing, bringing it forward. Um, it's backed by the County Council, the Greater Cambridgeshire Peterborough Authority and Bays. Um, at present, we have 166 homes signed up to the project out of 314 homes that are in the village. Um, sorry, the video will give some more context to, um, to the village itself. It is a conservation village kind of sitting between the Benlands and the Heathlands in East Cambridgeshire, about eight miles away from the main town. Um, the aspiration is to take um, homes and connect them to ground source, air source heat pumps by 2021, which is located in a central energy centre um, just outside of the village. And the whole programme should reduce um, the carbon footprint of Swaff and Prior by 36,000 tonnes in the first 20 years. And that's based on the 166 homes signing up, not the the full 300 that we would aspire to. Um, so this diagram just gives you a quick overview um, of uh, the three main energy sources. So we have ground source, air source, and also are looking to install solar panels um, to, to provide energy for the heat pumps. So it is aiming to be 100% renewable. We're actually hitting about 97% renewable um, on the project at present. So to give a bit of context to, um, to the project and what it means kind of in terms of national policy, um, we are currently in the fifth carbon budget um, that has been set to achieve net zero by 2050. Um, you'll see the red line um, has kind of stagnated between CB3, the carbon budget, third and fourth carbon budget, and that we really need to kind of push 
um, more innovative projects to to reinstate that that growth and bring us closer to the net zero 2050 budget. Within Cambridgeshire, and um, this is a diagram that shows our current carbon spend. And um, so you will see transport is the biggest contributor within the county. But where the county council is currently putting its focus is on um, the two sectors to the right side, which are domestic buildings and commercial services. Uh, services and industry, which accounts for 48% of our carbon footprint. The reason being that these are buildings and that they are kind of the controllable uh, infrastructure that can be put in place, whereas transport takes more of a, a cultural change at a national level. So um, buildings are the angle from which uh, the county council is looking to tackle and, and make those clean energy targets. So this shows um, the, the divergence that would be happening um, if we continued just following kind of UK policy and the projects um, that are in the pipeline uh, within the council and within the country. Um, this top black line shows where we would be running towards net zero and the red line shows where we need to be going and um, so there is obviously an increasing disparity there and um, that, that that set the pathway for swap and priors project to to happen so and um, this is an overview of what cambridgeshire county council have uh, been doing over the last few years uh, they have a dedicated unit, um, which is mobilising local energy, and that has borrowed significant sums, capital sums, uh, to make these investments and um, supply energy through the council. So um, we have Strangford closed landfill site that is uh, making a planning application this summer, as is Babraham Park and Ride. And then uh, we... Uh, well, I think it was six years ago, and um, the Sewham solar farm was built. And like Essex, we have a schools program that has now retrofitted solar and so on. And um, over the last uh, few years in 50 or 60 schools now. And um, Swaff and Prior, it should be said, kind of is, um, it's the first community led project that the council have been involved with and marks a, a sea change, I think, in how um, they are approaching projects as well. And some of those challenges I'll pick up on later. But um, this is an overview of the council's priority areas and how uh, this community heating project kind of fits in with those. So the first point being mitigation of um, energy and waste. Uh, the second being adaption um, and how um, the project looks to build uh, more resilient heating systems, a more resilient infrastructure that has a long term function in communities. Um, and that resilience is, of course, experienced at the customer level, the stakeholder level. And then the final point being natural capital and the impact that the project can make on air pollution. And um, so this is a bit more detail about the project itself and um, I just wanted to kind of highlight um, what the county's involvement has been and how, how the project was made possible, possible um, by their input. And so as I mentioned, the Mobilising Local Energy Investment Unit has provided um, a lot of support to the community itself and that they have enabled the borrowing capability that has been required to raise the grant funding that is needed for such a kind of big capital investment project and um, but also that they have provided the relationships with highways and um, rural states it's actually this energy center is being built on county council land and um, and also that they will be investing in the non-revenue generating components of the heating scheme. Um, and then the energy centre again is on uh, County Council Rural Estates land. 
um, it was designated for commercial land use and we fortunately have a supportive tenant farmer and um, so the diagram on the right of your screen just shows what um, what the layout is actually going to be of um, the boreholes and the solar array and the barn and then um, just towards the west effectively um, is the beginning of the village. Um, <clears throat> so this is a very complicated legal and financial structure um, of the project um, which again has been made possible by the fact that the County Council has the ability and the powers to generate, distribute and sell heat to its customer. Um, so if you look to the right of your screen you'll see a logo which belongs to the Community Land Trust and I think essential to this project has been kind of working out what that governance arrangement is and how um, the, the, the Community Land Trust have an ongoing stake in the project um, and how they um, can represent the community in, in this um, and the ongoing kind of pricing arrangements, the ongoing decisions that need to be made over what is a 20, 50 year investment. Um, I don't Bernie, know if I have time. Can I ask you to finish off so that we can Absolutely. get things on Last this. slide. Um, 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 it, so uh, just some of the challenges from the County Council's perspective. Um, has been the shift from uh, projects that have a small number of stakeholders to projects with a very large number of stakeholders and um, being the local community and um, the interest in being involved and the level of resourcing and expertise required, the new financial models that are presented by community energy and heating, the fact that every project that the council is involved with is likely to take on a new financial model. Um, and the commitment that is expected. Um, and again, like Essex, scaling up these projects is going to be the challenge. Um, the County Council has an ambition to take 10,000 homes off oil. Um, so this uh, project with Heating Swaff and Prior is hopefully a template um, for that in the future. Um, and what, what the community has provided um, deep community involvement, leadership time, very skillful support. So um, the project board that is involved with Heating Swaff and Prior actually has uh, experts in development planning and biodiversity um, on side, which has made a huge difference because the council doesn't necessarily have the resource to bring in those specialties um, early on in the project when they are useful. Um, energy enthusiasm and again kind of this connection with education has been really important thank you Janet thank you very much what a fascinating project and um, I'm sure there are lots of the community energy groups that would like to dive into it so we'll share that information um, but thank you very much and um, I note as well that the, um, it went from the land trust to Cambridgeshire County Council being involved so that the Bayes' heat network delivery unit could get involved and, and provide um, you know, more seed funding to get it off the ground. And 10,000 oil boilers is a great ambition. So we're all watching and there are other projects that we can link you up on that. Um, so Liz, I'm gonna ask you to highlight some questions or if there's anybody that wants to show their hand to ask a question to get you kicked off so we can see you all um, because there's been a whole array of questions in the um, in the Q&A. I noted that um, Tony from Reading Community Energy started off a discussion on energy efficiency and um, and there was discussions going on about hydrogen as well. Um, and um, somebody on the call from Pembrokeshire was saying about um, uh, an, a project in Swansea. Um, Why don't we start with Chris from Avesco who had some questions about um, 
about uh, education and schools. Is that right with you, Chris? They're obviously right sitting. Here next to me. Questions? Uh, yeah, maybe you could say it for me because I'm going to get. Okay, so Chris's question was uh, if it was, uh, where's it gone? It was about, yeah, problems with the Department of Education, really, because that was a stumbling block for us at Avesco. Has anybody, any, have any of the speakers any experience in tackling that? I can share our experience, um, which Thank was there's we've had two interactions with the education funding agency. The first was in 2016 because we, as well as doing that work with Salford, we worked with a charity to install panels on the community centre. And the lease of that community centre had a charge over it by the education funding agency. Um, and so we ended up negotiating the entire lease again with the education funding agency. I think we expected to send it off to them to a charge holder and get two or three comments and then for it to be signed off. And um, they, they made 50 or 60 amendments that they wanted. And so we ended up renegotiating it all again, but the um, officer involved did you know, take evening conference calls with us and stuff like that and helped us push it through to get it done so we could do the sites in the school holidays. Um, then the second interaction was when we did an academy school um, and having had a quite swift engagement with them in 2016, although painful. Um, yeah, in 2018, it took three or four months. They were very slow in coming back. They asked the school loads of random questions like how many children they had in key stage one and you, you know different things like that um, but it, it seemed like there was a process but it wasn't working very well but we did get the approval eventually and instead of installing the, the panels in the school holidays in the summer we did it at the Christmas ones. Thank you. Um, now, Ollie, there was a question from Tom at Celesco about onshore wind. I think it, I can't remember the question. Oh, and also he had a question to Janet about uh, about the target energy cost. Tom, are you still here? Let's have a look. Tom, yeah, hi. Here. Yes, my question is really to um, uh, John Taylor. Uh, the um, the str um, strategy that he, he presented from the uh, energy uh, strategy uh, didn't include onshore wind. Uh, I can imagine the document was written when onshore wind wasn't uh, possible, but now it's becoming more possible. Is that strategy going to be reviewed? Thank you, Tom. Good question. Good to see you. Yeah, um, yeah. I think yeah, there have been some changes about reopening onshore wind and onshore solar farms for the contracts for different supports so there is some positive movement in that sense um i'm not sure that particular strategy would be updated but like we would welcome we'd welcome more um onshore wind applications on our area certainly through the rural community energy fund that's one of the eligible technologies um and yeah we'd certainly yeah see if we can do some test cases through the planning system either via the neighborhood planned route or uh, there have been uh, the Rural Community Energy Fund people with us five offices in each energy hub and we do have meetings and that onshore wind question has come up and so we've, there have been examples of um, onshore winds that have had planning permission granted since the kind of changes were made but yeah happy to talk about that more and see if we can make any happen. So Ollie can I just add to that Yes. Go ahead, Tom. Um, so I'm, I'm just in the process of developing a local energy strategy in Essex. And we have previously looked at um, utility scale solar developments on land assets that we own. We have uh, eight, eight or nine sites where it looks quite promising, but we responded very positively in favour of onshore wind in the recent CFD consultation. And we will definitely be looking to try and bring forward onshore wind applications um, 
either as an investor ourselves or as an off taker uh, for the power because that's that's another lever that we that we have so um, so we're definitely in support of it um, and uh, you know would welcome looking looking again at our land assets to see if um, the economics of onshore wind are more favourable than solar. Great, and that that brings me up. You know that link between community energy groups and their local authorities. You know if the local authorities are, um, you know, adding um, input into like the CFD consultations, the, to try and make that link between the community energy groups and your local authorities. And, and support those consultations as well. And um, so, that, so that, you know, there's more momentum to it. So that's a really good link with the local authorities. Um, now, can I, I'm just gonna go um, freestyle and see if there's anybody out there from anywhere else in the country. Um, I see there's Anthony in South, South Staffordshire. Um, anybody else wanna throw in a question for the panel? Tony from Reading. Yeah, am I straight on? You are straight on. Yes, we, I do Reading Community Energy Society and a load of other stuff, but we've come across loads of buildings where the tenant in a commercial building is very keen to have solar PV on their roof and they pay the energy bills and the landlord blocks it. And it's really, really bad. I th I'd really love it if Community Energy South could take that on as a kind of lobbying action because I think it's wrong that the landlord can block solar PV on a commercial building um, when it's, it doesn't really worry him too much. Like solar PV on the roof, it increases the value of this building and it helps the tenant. And quite often tenancies are quite long term or even very long term and probably the new people have won it as well anyway. So it's a really big problem that we hit all the time, landlords blocking solar PV on roofs, commercial ones. Okay, um, um, okay yeah, I'm happy. Can, we raise, can you raise your hand if you've had a similar issue? Uh, there you go, There's, I can see a hand there. John, I think yeah. you're gonna respond. Yeah, um, well, I can certainly say um, uh, with our connections with the LEPs and uh, yeah, happy to raise any issues like that with those sorts of forums and chambers of commerce. Um, and I know some local authorities have invested quite a lot in commercial property as well. So, if yeah, happy to kind of go and find the connections and the, have the conversations with the right people if it helps. Happy to take on a challenge like that. Great, John. Let's raise those, Tony. There's a link with the energy. Yeah, health. I mean, I, I think it's almost like a government level thing um, because we've obviously we've got solar PV on commercial buildings that we've done, but too many cases of blocked by the landlord. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, I'm sure it's not just us that's going to come across this. No, and do you think, um, Tony, John... <coughs> Can you not hear me? <laughs> um, Ollie, oh, he's muted. Um, well, while Ollie gets himself back on track, actually. <laughs> Sorry, Ollie, I think you should speak. Uh, I was just going to comment on that. Yeah, it's 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 an internationally recognised conundrum of the disincentive of a landlord supporting renewables in site, and I've seen it mentioned in blogs for years from you know developers in the states. I think the answer is is basically start with the landlords and see what uh, motivation they might have, what their agendas are, whether they're uh, interested in um, carbon reduction. Some actually who are forward thinking might see, you know, like on a business park, um, that uh, it attracts tenants, particularly when uh, they're, you know, there's going to be less occupancy of business units now. If they've got PV on the roof, that might attract 
tenants to move in there. So I'd start with the landlord because uh, yeah. they fundamentally are the decision makers. Yeah, I'll just add that um, West Sussex County Council have been doing a business park renewable project um, with Manor Royal, um, which is near Gatwick Airport. It's a project um, funded with EU funding, looking at creating a local energy community on that business park. So, um, yeah, I think there may be some learning coming out of that on that topic as well. Good. So Can I add? Liz and then Tony at Reading. Um, just this is actually a from a conversation I had with Dave Robinson um, a bit a couple of days ago. The fact that I think a lot of the commercial property sector, particularly in the city, are now going to be in, in post COVID are going to be in trouble. And so, if um, some of the lobby groups that we may all know will be a part of, some of the green lobby groups could uh, seize that and use that as an opportunity to leverage an insistence that it, in a post COVID future, uh, landlords do have to take much more account of. Um, that, uh, including solar or something renewable in their in their in their contracts and in their gen in in their contracts with their tenants. That's that would be my take on it, and it would require some uh, lobbying with some of the um, commercial uh, landlords, you know, commercial landlord associations, or some liaising with the commercial landlord associations. But, but they're going to, you know, they're in trouble in the future. They're, they're they're facing difficulties because of post COVID. So it would be a good time for lobbying and campaigning organizations to uh, get in there and make an impact so thanks for raising that point tony great over to tony do you want to no I, I don't want to say any more thank you well i've got lots more to say but i'm not saying it no <laughs> it's great okay and i think there's just a room for one more question if there's anybody there if not i'm going to close this session and summarize uh, penny had no, some questions but um it's coming up to half past and i expect knowing um yeah we're world... so short on time i'm happy to pass thank you penny um so community in south we've got another masterclass next week as part of community energy fortnight looking at administration around share offers so, um, and um, I think we've had about 20 or 30 people already sign up for that, haven't we, Liz? So that's, yeah. um, we're looking forward to that with Share Energy and um, um, other speakers uh, administrating. I think somebody from Celesco, one of your people at Celesco, I think, is talking, and Andre Pinho, about um, managing shareholders and managing the share register. So rather than once you're out trying to get people in, it's once you've got some projects going, the, the, the most efficient way that you can manage your uh, share register. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you for all the speakers from um, Tom in Essex, Nicola of Main Energy, um, John Taylor from the Energy Hub. We really appreciate all you do for us. Um, Kate up in um, Greater Manchester, you are another hero from the sector and um and janet from cambridgeshire that's a really inspiring project so thank you very much and we'll put the presentations up on the website and see you all out there thank you thank you have a good day all bye, bye.